Make your way over to 2 Samuel. We're in a series called Rise and Fall, looking at the life of David. And we're going to be in chapter 21 is where we're going to start. And we're actually going to conclude our series today in 2 Samuel. Some of you are like, ah, finally, finally. So yes, we are concluding our message. And so there are going to be portions of scripture where we're just going to fly by today. Um, but we're going to see kind of the last words of David as we uh, next week we'll jump into a, a series, a small series in the book of Psalms. And we're actually just going to look at a, a number of Psalms that even David wrote. So uh, some of the greatest hits in our, in our Psalms. So come back uh, next week as we'll kind of unpack uh, a, a Psalm. But Psalm or not Psalm, Second Sam. Second Samuel 21, what we're going to see kind of like right off the bat is that David is going to have to make a hard right, right? Making the hard right. Our, our, our staff or our leadership, we gather together as a whole staff, everyone, uh, at least once a month for a staff lunch. And what we've been doing over the last few weeks have been watching some, some leadership videos by a pastor, uh, not just to become like um, good leaders, but just great parents, uh, and it's like, these are habits that he is wanting to, to help us. And one of the habits that we've been looking at was, it was making the hard right. For many of us, especially for dads, we want to, to make easy decisions. And oftentimes, easy decisions are the wrong decisions. But good leaders and good parents and good moms know that uh, we don't make easy decisions. That's often the easy wrong. We want to make the hard decisions. And hard decisions, um, although hard, are usually the right decisions. And David makes a hard right in this text. And so as we jump in, let's look at 2 Samuel 21, verse 1. It says, now there was a famine in the days of David, a famine for three years. And year after year, and David sought the face of the Lord. And so right here in 2 Samuel 21, there, there's a famine in the land. Now, just so that we're all on the same page, like oftentimes, more often than not, in the Old Testament, right, famines only occur because of sin in the land. Right, the, very, the law of God was very clear that when you obey him, there is going to be blessing after blessing. God never expected perfection uh, in the Old Testament. God wanted obedience. And God said, if you will just walk with me like we just sung, I will bless you. I will guide you. There will be life and blessing. But if you don't walk with me, if there is high-handed, willful sin, I will shut off the spigot of blessing. He's like, I'm not bluffing. And so when there's a famine in the land, David rightly knows that God is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over life. He is sovereign over, nat uh, over nature. And so David is now seeking God. Like, why on earth is there a famine? What happened? What sin needs to be confessed? And we see the answer is found in verse 1. Here's why there's a famine. And the Lord said, there is blood guilt on Saul, and on his house. There's something Saul and his household have done because he put the Gibeonites to death. Right? There, there's a famine because Saul and some of those in his household had killed the Gibeonites. Now, for some of you, you hear Gibeonites and you're like, oh yeah, the Gibeonites. And some of you are like, uh, the Gibeonites. Where on earth is that? You have to go all the way back to Joshua 9 to learn about the Gibeonites, right? The Gibeonites were, were actually a, a part, like when, when the nation of Israel is actually going in to take the land that God has given them, right? The Gibeonites were one of those nations and they were clever, right? The Gibeonites were ones that actually, they understood the times. They knew that God was bringing judgment on the nations for their wickedness. And so they were saying, we don't want to be judged by the God of Israel. We are seeking God's mercy and grace. And so they schemed to where Joshua made an oath with them. So all the way back in Joshua 9, you saw that Joshua made an oath with the people of Gibeon not to harm them. It was a promise. 
It was an oath. It was a covenant saying, you now actually are not going to be judged by God. You will receive mercy and grace. So Joshua gave an oath of protection. But Saul broke that oath. And Saul broke that promise. And Saul broke that covenant. And so now God is bringing judgment because his name was dishonored. And so verse 2, look what David does. And so David, the king, called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Although the people of Israel have sworn to spare them, to protect them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal. So Saul right now is, has dishonored God. He's not just dishonored his oath, has just dishonored his covenant with the Gibeons. He, he has actually dishonored the God that whom he represents. The law of God was also very clear that Israel's king was meant to seek God, but to honor God. Is meant to seek him and actually honor him. And so Saul, he breaks it. And so rather than just to honor God, he has dishonored him. And now God has to defend his name. God now wants to uphold his name because it's just been dragged through the mud. And so here's this like this call, like you, you cannot, God is saying you cannot ignore sin. And David is put in this now leadership position. Is he gonna overlook the sin of Saul? You can't do this. And so it's like, for me now, it's like, a, how do we apply this? It's like, it's for, as a church, it's like elders here cannot overlook sin. Parents, moms in the room, wait, no matter how easy it might be just to overlook sin, we're not called to overlook sin. It dishonors God, it dishonors him. And so in verse three, look what David does. And David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? David now is like, he is committed to making a hard decision. He's committed to making a hard right. He knows that this people have been treated unjustly. A covenant has been broken. The oath has been broken. A promise has been broken. And not only have they suffered the consequences, it's like God's name has been dishonored. David knows that the people, they only not only think ill of the people of Israel, they think ill of Israel's God. And David says, I want to restore this. No matter how hard this decision is, no matter the cost he wants to restore, David wants to make things right and establish, reestablish the glory of God. And so look what happens, verse four. The Gibeonites said to David, it is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. Take note of that. We're gonna come back to that later. Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel but in verse five, they said to the king, the, the man who consumed us planned to destroy us so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel. Verse six, let seven of his sons be given to us so that we may hang them before Yahweh, the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. Whew, that's a hard text. So here now, now David is saying, like, notice what the Gibeonites are asking. They're saying, we don't, we, they didn't want a war, right? They're not looking to war with Israel. What do they want? They want atonement. They want things to be made right. They're not looking for extortion, silver, gold. What do they want? They want justice. That's what they want. And so just as their family was murdered, they want justice on the house of Saul. They want some of Saul's lineage, descendants, killed. So we have ourselves a little problem here, folks. If you've been with us throughout this kind of series, we have a problem, right? Who is a descendant of Saul, right? Who is, who is now under wrath? 
Mephibosheth. You remember Mephibosheth? Some of you are like, I have no idea who this is. Should have been here a couple weeks ago. <laughs> right? You remember Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth is the, is the son of Jonathan, the one that David has made an oath for to protect. So what about him now? Well, verse 7, but the king, but David spared Mephibosheth. He spared him. The son of of Saul's son, Jonathan, because an oath, the Lord that was between them, between David and Jonathan and the son of Saul. All right, David now is going to save. He saves Mephibosheth. He saves them yet again. Right, he was the one that was under God's wrath or under the wrath of the king. And yet he is spared yet again. David spares him. Why? Because David has made an oath to him. There is a covenant there is an oath, there is a promise. And David, unlike Saul, is faithful to keep his word. And so the covenant of, uh, the covenant of David with Mephibosheth actually covers a multitude of sins. It covers the sin of his grandfather. And so he is saved, right? Mephibosheth, how is he saved? He is saved by a promise. He's not saved of his own works. He is saved by the promise of the king. Verse 8, then the king took two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, whom she bore to Saul, Armani and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Mirib, the daughter of Saul. All right, so it's a different Mephibosheth that we see in verse 8. All right, it's the daughter of, uh, of Ai, Right, that Mephibosheth. But now, here's what I want to say. Like, when you see, like, here are now, like, seven sons that are going to be judged. And some of I mean, like, I don't know about you. Like, I read this, like, that makes me feel uncomfortable. But what I think we need to, re- pop, we need to know is that these were men that were, that were implicated um, in, they were involved with the offense. At least we, it doesn't tell us explicitly, but, like, when you read and you hear the response that they're not wanting any man to die. There, there is something Saul and his household has done. And so many believe that these men that are coming to be judged, they are judged because they were a part of what Saul was doing. They were part of this, uh, the murders. And so they thought they were getting away with something. They thought they were getting away with wickedness. Right, so this isn't like the reaping, right? Have you been familiar with the, like the Hunger Games where it's like all of a sudden they just like, like make a tribute from like, oh, let's just draft some people and see who's gonna get judged. No, these are people that were likely involved with the offense. And so in verse nine, and David gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites and they hanged them there on the mountain before the Lord and the, sevens, and the seven of them perished together. They were judged they were judged for their wickedness that was committed. And, I, and like the, right at the end of the verse, it says, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. I mean, that's, that's important for us now to, to remember. Like their judgment came right at the beginning of the barley harvest. Why? Because remember what's going on. There's a famine in the land. And at the beginning of the barley harvest, that's where you are longing, like that's where like the rains need to come in order that the crops might come in. And so they are, they are in a season and they're in a time where rain is needed. And so the, the, the question is, is like, will the, will the famine now stop? Will the rains come? And so we, we get the answer in verse 10, but it's kind of an odd looking verse. Look at verse 10. Then Rizpah, right, the mother that was up in verse 8, Rizpah took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the rain fell upon them from the heavens. And she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day or the, or the beasts of the field by night. Isn't, that, this, this an, isn't this an odd verse? Here is this mother Here's this mother in the text. She takes like the dead bodies of the seven sons and she lays them on the rocks. 
Like, why does she lay them on the rocks before God? Like, what is she doing? Why, why lay them before God? I mean, the, the text doesn't tell us, but I don't think it's hard for us to interpret. Essentially, you know what this mother is doing? This mother is essentially, she's praying. She's, she's asking God, would you now send the rains? Why? Why, would, why would God be pleased to send rain? Because atonement actually has been made. I mean, she, she understands that God's honor now has been restored. All right? His wrath has been appeased. In other words, it's like she lays these, these sons like on the rocks before God. She's just like, she's calling now on God to honor his word. She's just pleading with God, like, will you relent? Will you send the rains? Will you relent and would you show, will you show mercy? Would you show mercy? And in verse 14, we see that God was moved by her prayer, by her action, and he he ends the famine. He ends the famine. And I don't know about you. It's like I read this, this text, and it's like, that's an odd story. Right? Welcome, Mother's Day. Right? Here's the text. But I, I mean, I, I look at this like, that text, though, and as odd as that story might be, has so many great gospel reminders for us today. Incredible gospel reminders. Well, let me just give you one is that just as, as David made a hard decision, but a right decision, a hard right, not an easy wrong, our God is a God who makes a hard right, a hard right, meaning we all have committed great offenses. Every single one of us in this room and every single one listening online, we have made offenses. In other words, we have dishonored God. We have dishonored his name, right? Are there, are there people in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace that think ill of us as Christians and ill of our God because of the things that we have said and the things that we have done? I didn't get an amen, but the, yes, I would say yes, that, that's happened, right? We have all types of people that think ill of us and think ill of our God because of how we have act, right? And as a result, what is needed? Atonement is needed. Wrongs need to be made right. Someone needs to be judged. And aren't you thankful it's not our sons and it's not our daughters? They are not the ones that get judged. But a son gets judged. And it's not my son and it's not your son. It is God's son. God's son was willing to be judged on our behalf. And so we get this great gospel reminder all the way back in 2 Samuel 21 that we understand that an atonement has been made because of Jesus, right? And because of that, God's wrath has been appeased. He is honored. He is honored and restored his name. And not only that, just like Mephibosheth, Right? Mephibosheth is safe because of the oath and the promise that David the king has made. And likewise, we, right, we can have assurance that because of what Christ has done, his promise, his oath, his covenant, right, we are going to be saved all the way to the end, to our last days, just like David's covenant with Mephibosheth, because his promise is true. And so I'll let you now read, kind of not right now, but read the rest of chapter 21 on your own. Right? You can see like verses 20, uh, 15 to 22. Those are actually some great verses. A couple weeks ago, I met with, a, uh, I want to say, an old man Bible study, an older man Bible study. And they asked that I would come and talk with them. And there I shared uh, in that. It's just kind of a, verses 15 to 22 is just a great message for older men and older women. Because what you see is actually David grows weary in battle. Why does he grow weary in battle? You know why? Because he's getting old. He's getting old. But here's the thing. The battle will always continue. 
And so this is a great text, 15 to 22, as a reminder is that even though the, we get old, the battle continues. It's like, what do we need to do? We, get, we better make sure we train the next generation to fight. Because the enemy, what are they? They're always young and they are fresh. And they are coming after the people of God. And not only are they young and fresh, they will bring a new sword. And so just kind of a reminder for us is that there are, all, there are always an enemy out there, a young and fresh enemy with a new sword, a new ideology, a new worldview, a new philosophy, always trying to take out the people of God. But God is faithful when we raise up the next generation. The people of Beth, like the boys or the men or the people of Bethlehem will always take out the people of Gath. So just a great passage for older women, older men, raise up the next generation. And so then we look at chapter 22. Actually, we're not going to look at chapter 22 because it's a song. It's a song of David. You know what it is? It's actually Psalm 18. It's the only psalm that's actually recorded twice in our Bibles. And so guess what I'm going to do next week as we kick off Psalms? Psalm 18. So if you want to know what he says, come back next week. And so what we're going to do now is look at chapter 23 and just look at his last words. David's last words. It's like almost like David is nostalgic. It's like his, uh, uh, a nostalgic reminder. He's just reflecting back at the faithfulness of God and reflecting back, not at only God's faithfulness, but reflecting back at the faithfulness of the people that God has placed around him. It's just marvelous little verses. And so we're just going to take a few minutes and look at these great verses of David's last words. All right? Chapter 23, verse 1. Look at it. It says, now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of God of Jacob. Isn't it interesting? Here is this, here's this great king, King David, and lo look how he describes himself. He, he describes himself as the, as the son of Jesse. Right? He's just a, a small town boy from a small town father. And yet what has God done? God has raised him up and elevated him. He's from really like a know-nothing place, know-nothing family, and yet God was faithful to him. God is the one who anointed him. God is the one who elevated this man. He's not anything special. He doesn't have this like great and glorious background. God is just faithful to, to bring him up. He is an ordinary man, but God is the one who has elevated and exalted him. Someone from Bethlehem. So, and look at the last clause. Like the last part of that verse in verse one, it says, David is the one, he's like, he describes himself as the sweet psalmist of Israel. That's how he wants to be remembered. Isn't that interesting? As the sweet psalmist. He doesn't say as, the, as a mighty warrior. Right? He's the one that actually uh, redeemed or saved the nation. He's the one that took down the strong man, the champion, the enemy. Like his victory became the nation's victory. But that's not how he wants to be described, right? He doesn't boast or brag about his, him, him beating Goliath. What's he want to be known for? He wants to be known as the sweet psalmist. He wants to be known for the, for the one who writes about the majesty and the glory of God. Isn't that great? He wants us to know that he sang songs to God. The greatest warrior is actually the greatest worshiper in Israel. And I don't want to speak on behalf of moms, but I will. Isn't that what we as, as mothers, isn't that what we want for our sons and daughters? Isn't that what you want? You long for them to, to bring praise to our king. It's not so much about their power or their position that moms want their sons and daughters to write and to glory in the God of Israel because he has done great works. So, and in verse two, David claims something. He claims inspiration, that his words are not his words. His words are God's words. 
Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. He, so David understands. Somehow he knows that like the words that he is, he is writing down are not his words. They are God's words. They are divine. And he is giving it to us today. And look what he tells them. Right In verse 3, this is what he says. When one rules justly over men, they rule in the fear of God. It's like his words, like this inspiration from God actually begins with leadership. Those who lead are meant to lead justly. Those who lead are meant to, to lead with the, the very fear of God. And that might sound like overly simplistic, but that's the reality that David has given to us from God. A leader must follow God. A leader must be someone that actually is, is guided by God. They, they are ruling justly. They are ruling in the fear of God. This isn't just for those in like a, a position of leadership like myself. I mean, like think families, fathers, mothers, wherever God has placed you, where you have influence, that's leadership. He's saying you must follow, follow God. And, and, oh, that we would understand this. Because when you, ha when you have might, and when you have power, but you don't have conscience, do you know what that produces? It produces a beast. That's what a beast is. A beast is power without a conscience. It's might without, uh, without morality. That's what happens when, when a nation or a leader rules in, in such a way where they don't fear God and they don't rule justly. Right? It's a simple truth, but many nations haven't figured that out. And so what happens, though, if someone, if an individual and a nation will actually rule, if he or she will rule justly in the fear of God, what does it produce? Verse 4 tells us, and he, meaning God, dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. All right, so th th this is not a difficult like, word to interpret. It's really quite clear, quite plain. When you will rule justly, when you rule in the fear of God, what does God say? That person, right, you will see light, life, and blessing. When a le leader rules in the fear of God, there is light. There is life. There is growth. There is blessing. Right? And this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like someday. A kingdom where you see the light of God. You see, you see life and you see nothing but blessing. That's what we are longing for as God's people. That kingdom finally and fully here. In the meantime, right, Ephesians tells us that the church is like the manifold wisdom of God. The church, us, the people of God, are, are like a, a picture of that. We're like a preview of what that kingdom is going to look like someday. When the church at its best is actually living justly in the fear of God, ruling justly in the fear of God, we produce light, life, growth, and blessing not only for ourselves, but for all of those around us. We are a great picture of the kingdom of heaven to come when we are doing things rightly and well. So we see light, we see blessing, but what happens to the one who doesn't, who will not submit to the king? Verse six, but worthless men are like thorns that will be thrown away. They cannot be taken with the hand, but the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of the spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. What does God say? Those that don't do this, they will be consumed. They will be judged, and they will perish. So, I mean, so here as David is kind of signing off, 
I mean, these are his last words. And, and they're meant to bring kind of like encouragement. He is just reflecting back. Look what God has done. Because I have submitted to him, that the heart of David was like, I want to put God at the center of not just my life, but the center of the nation's life. God says, I will elevate you. I will bless you. And so he is just reflecting on the faithfulness of God and encouraging, encouraging others to do likewise. Now, he doesn't just reflect on his faithfulness. I love the last few verses. And just for a few minutes, I want us to look at, it's like a nostalgic reminder, not just on God's faithfulness, but the faithfulness of friends, the faithfulness of the community that, that God put around David. Look at, look at the people that are in David's life. We'll start in verse 8. It says, and there are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph, Bashabeth, the Tecmanite. Right, that's a, you're like, how did, on earth did you pronounce it so well? You just got to say it fast and with confidence, right? <laughs> I have no idea if I did. All right, so here you have this guy named Joshabeth, Bashabeth, right here. He's the chief of the three. And he wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. All right, so here's this individual. He's also known for some of your versions, or uh, he's known as uh, Jashobim or, or Odino. Some say Odino, right? This guy has such a long name. He needs a nickname, okay? He needs a nickname. And David now remembers this man. Why does he remember this man? If you're taking notes, I just put down, he remembers this man because this guy has done great things. Here's a man who does great things. He, he, no one can physically do this without God's enablement and without God's help. No one alone but God. Here is this one man wrecking machine. It says he takes down 800. But here's just a kind of reminder of like God's faithfulness. God was faithful to put a strong man behind right beside David, a man who does great things. And so like, I, I mean, how do you apply this? I, I just put down in my margins here, like, moms, will you, will you pray for your kids? Pray, I know you're praying for your kids. Mom, pray, pray that your sons and daughters would do great thing, great things for the king. In fact, that's what I'll pray right now. Father, I pray not just for my son, my daughter, but the sons and daughters of those here at New Covenant those that were just dedicated today. God, would you do great things through them? Great things. Amen. Verse nine. Not only is uh, this guy, look who else is next to him. He has another man next to him. His name is Eleazar. He was, the, he was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel withdrew. So here now we have another man Right? He's not just doing great things. What, what, is, what is like important about this guy, Eleazar? You can put down courageous. Right? Eleazar is someone that when everyone else is running, says all of Israel flee, what does he do? He stands right next to the king. He will not leave David. So when everyone else is fleeing, he is going to stand firm and fight for Yahweh. And so moms, I would just say, and I keep praying. Pray every day that your kids would be strong and courageous. Like one of the prayers that I pray over Abby and Ben every single day, some of my prayers, I mean, like they're, 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 they're repeated. It's because I, I want God to do just that. Like I pray that God would give them wisdom, wisdom beyond their years. And not only wisdom to know what's right, I always pray, wisdom to know what's right and courage to do what's right, even when it's hard and scary. And so we should be praying for our sons and daughters that, that they would be strong and courageous, that when they stand firm, um, they stand firm for God. Verse 10, he's not just courageous. Look what else he does. He rose, struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about great victory on that day and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. This guy fought so long. It's like he had this like, oh, he cramped up. 
It's like all of a sudden he just has a claw. Right, that's how hard he fought. And so he's not only courageous, but what else is he? He's actually selfless. He's humble. Because when there's a victory, guess what happens? The people then come back and plunder. All right, if, I, if a lesser man like me would be like, hey, you didn't even do anything. All right, you don't get any part of the spoils. That's not his attitude. And so this guy's not only courageous, he's selfless. He allows the people to come and reap the benefit that they didn't earn and they didn't deserve. So he's OK with it. He's just a great man. Verse 11, and next to him was Shema. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot on the ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines. And he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. I, I don't know about you. Let's just be honest. Would you fight for a battle of lentils? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fighting for a plot of beans. And yet this guy does, right? Why does he stand firm? Because it's God's land. All right, this is like another, another little verse where it's like a reminder that there, there's nothing like, even though it seems unimportant, and even though it seems really small, this guy is going to stand firm. All right, he stands for a field of beans, and he gets remembered for it. He gets remembered. And so it's actually a great patriotic verse. It's God's land. And he will not allow it to go to the enemy. So you just see, like, he stands firm. He stands with the king. And he fights for Yahweh. And so we could go on and on. I have several other little verses. Um, I want to look at one more. Why don't you scroll down real quick to, to verse 20. Why don't you look at Benaiah? What a great, great guy. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two aerials of Moab, right? He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when a snow had fallen, right? He kills two Moabite champions. But not only that, he kills, it says he killed a lion in a pit in a snowy day, right? That's kind of an odd little verse, all right? But you know what's great? Like, I think it was like Matthew Henry who writes about this guy. And you know, here's what I love. He, he talks about how to kill a lion is a difficult task, right? That's a difficult deed. To kill a lion in a pit is not just a difficult task, it's a difficult place. And not only to kill a lion in a pit, but to kill him on a snowy day, it's a difficult time. And so it's just a reminder for us that here is a man Right, that stood strong in a difficult time, in a difficult place, with a difficult task. He trusted in God. And so then I put, moms, you're our Beniah, right? Doing a difficult deed, oftentimes with the difficult kids in a difficult place. And so we're thankful. We're thankful for you. And so um, these are David's last words as he's signing off. Just a remembrance of God's faithfulness, God's promises, and the faithfulness of God's people. So here's my big idea. A little big idea today was there is blessing in life because of God's grace and faithfulness um, and the faithful followers around you, especially our mamas. And so um, I'm going to pray. But before I do, I just want to, again, for those of you here, if you've never trusted Jesus, the very Son of God. He is the one who gives life and blessing. There is no judgment. There is no wrath. Wrath has been appeased for those who look to him who died in your place. And so let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word. It gives us hope. It gives us encouragement. It gives us instruction. And my prayer my prayer is one, if there's anyone here that has never trusted Jesus for the life and forgiveness that he offers, that they would look to him. He is the author of our salvation. 
God, I pray that those that need him would look to him. In fact, even those of us who have trusted you, we have hurts and pains and struggles and hardships that we need your help, your enablement, your empowerment. And so we ask that you would intervene in a very powerful way. Not only would you surround us with our reminders of what you have done on our behalf, would you surround us with faithful friends and a faithful community that will stand alongside us even when it's hard and even when it's scary. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.